I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. Church, please grab your Bible and turn it back to John chapter one. If you've not been with us, uh, we are preaching now and we'll take us through much of the remainder of the year in the gospel of John. Very excited about it. Uh, Last week, if you weren't with us, covered a very, very critical part of John's gospel, that prologue, verses one through 18, where we see the identity of Jesus Truly God, truly man, he's come to save, having life in himself. But this week, as we jump in to verse 19 and following, it's all about the ministry of John the Baptist. And if you know what John's ministry is about, then you know it's all about getting people ready for the king. It's all about preparation. And in his preparation ministry, I've been thinking a lot about preparation this week and the links that people go to to prepare for things that quite honestly just don't seem that urgent and important, okay? It's like the first time in the year when the weatherman says it's gonna snow and ice. I don't know if I have any IGA faithfuls in here across the street, but you go in the IGA, I mean, it's like somebody said nuclear war was happening. I mean, they've cleaned, I mean, every single shelf, everything's gone. You know, at other times it's been the toilet paper. I mean, people are getting ready. They, they're, they're wanting to prepare. This last week, it was the eclipse. I mean, people coming across the nation. And listen, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I mean, it's a cool thing. It doesn't happen very often. People driving from everywhere, especially to get in the line of that eclipse, huge traffic jams. Devin calls me the other day and says, hey, you know how most of the time, most people aren't just hanging out outside their house. Most people keep to themselves inside their homes. She's like, listen, I'm driving through our neighborhood. I mean, everybody's garage doors open. They're all on the front lawn, sitting on the ground, looking up into the sky. And she said, honestly, I'm a little creeped out right now. (laughs) And I said, listen, I understand. It's not normal. But people prepare. I mean, think about some of the things we prepare for, things that are going to come and go. But when Jesus enters, he doesn't enter to come and go. He enters to come and reign as king. And there are lasting effects. And all I thought about all week is if many people were preparing for the return of the sun as for the eclipse of the sun, we'd be in a lot different position. Are we ready to receive him? Are we prepared for Jesus? Would you stand with me and we'll read in John chapter one, Starting in verse 19, we'll read through verse 23 to begin, just this short section. John writes, this is the testimony of John, this is John the Baptist, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Would you pray with me? Jesus, would you prepare us to receive you? Lord, I just pray that it would be so real to us, not just your first coming, but your second, that you will return and that we would in the same spirit make straight the way of the Lord. Lord, that we would ready ourselves, but Lord, we would do everything we can to make sure our family and our friends know, Lord Jesus, that you have come to save and that people would not miss it. Lord, let us not miss you. And I pray it in your name, amen. You may be seated. 
So if you're following along in terms of outline this morning, I put this on there and then I realized what I did. You're gonna have a song in your head all day, but here comes the son. That's really John's ministry. Here comes the son of God. Here comes the lamb of God. That's Jesus's ministry or John the Baptist's ministry, his focal point, three simple points. If you're taking notes of what John the Baptist said they need to get ready for. He was coming to reign as king, coming to die, but ultimately coming to save. But before we jump into those three points, I think a little bit of context is necessary that John the Baptist doesn't really speak to some of the initial context of what was happening out by the Jordan River. And so I wanna talk about that for a moment to set up why in verse 19, a delegation was sent to investigate what was going on. First thing I wanna do is go back to John chapter one, verses six through eight, where we're, giving a, we're given a, a purpose statement of sorts of John's ministry. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Very clear purpose. John's role is simple. Point people to Jesus. I hope we understand that's our role too, is to point people to Christ. Three times he uses the word light in those three verses. Three times he uses the word witness. He's drawing a sharp distinction, wanting to make sure we readily understand Jesus is the light. He's the only light of the world. And John is a witness. John is a servant. That's what John was doing. John was breaking onto the scene, pointing people to the fact that Christ was coming. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what was taking place? A movement. People were coming in droves to see this. I believe it was a kind of spectacle to behold. Walking out, all these people are being baptized in the Jordan River. Some people were going to repent, to make ready themselves. Other people were going because it was piquing their curiosity. There was no shortage of momentum in this thing. There was a huge movement taking place and that's why they're sending a delegation to ask what's happening. And not just that, John the Baptist wasn't the most normal figure of all time, and though it doesn't say it here, it does in the synoptics. You know, he was dressed pretty interestingly. He was wearing camel hair. He was wearing weird things. He was eating locusts and wild honey. He was kind of a wild man, okay? And he wasn't a soft guy. He wasn't a soft preacher, okay? He was giving it straight. And they're thinking, what in the world is going on? A kind of revival was taking place. Why were all those people there? Well, it definitely wasn't because John had employed some kind of attractional method in his ministry. You can see that just in the way that he dressed and the way that he approached this thing. He wasn't doing giveaways and door prizes and giving away flat screens TVs, trying to bring people in. He wasn't trying to address some relevant thing that he felt like everybody would be interested in and would pique their curiosity. He had a very simple message that he was preaching and the Lord God's hand was in this. That's why they were there. And what was he preaching? Matthew chapter three, verse two, repent. Turn away from your sin. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Think about this. Jesus said, John, that there was, in being born of man, not another person greater than John. Think about that. Moses, Elijah, I mean, fire from heaven, King David, Jesus said, no one born of woman was greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist doesn't even do any miracles. Why was he so great in the Lord's sight? Well, it wasn't because of something about him. It was because he bore witness to Christ in a special way like no one else ever had at that time. It was all about mission. It was all about bearing witness to Jesus. This is what made him so special. In the same way, this is the way we bring glory to the Lord. And it's for that reason, setting up our understanding of this, that I wanna look at this text with a twofold focus of Christ coming, knowing he's coming. Number one, we need to see John's ministry, how they were preparing themselves, how we ought to prepare ourselves, but also in principle and application, we need to take from John some principles of how we likewise should witness for Christ that we should help people ready themselves to receive Christ and who he is. First thing John clearly begins to address 
is the fact that Jesus comes to reign. Jesus shows up and he is the promised king of Israel. Look at verse 19. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. John had a humility to him. He had a great clarity about his position and his call in his ministry. This isn't about me. This is about the Messiah. The word Messiah means anointed ones, the promised king. This is the promised savior of the people. Now, just for a moment, I want to put ourselves in John's shoes. Success could be potentially an intoxicating thing. Here he comes, otherwise unknown up to this point in history, but all of a sudden everybody knows his name. Now we don't know what he was going through, but he was human like us. And all these people are now giving him attention and flocking to him. Some people are literally thinking he is the Messiah. And certainly for any of us experiencing any kind of success, whether it's in a ministry context or a career context, when people start to look to you and you begin to garner influence and acclaim, you can kind of want to leverage that. Well, actually, you know, now I think about it, I'm preaching pretty good, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'll be on your podcast. You know, you, know, you start getting, you, like you have something when, but John doesn't. That's what's so key. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. It's not that John didn't only not claim to be the Christ, that would have been outrageous. But he wasn't silent. He took it a step further. He was adamant that everybody understood, I'm not the Christ. Because his desire, I don't want you to look to me. I don't want you to be dependent upon me. I want you to look to Jesus. I want you to know Jesus. Everything about what you need is in Jesus. It is in him. And we need to take some cues from John the Baptist. We are not the Christ. People don't need me. People don't need you. People need the Lord Jesus. They need the light who comes and who can truly change and who can truly transform. This is so important in spiritual leadership, something that we should all be engaged in as followers of Jesus is spiritual leadership. Whether it's in vocational ministry or whether you're leading a community group, you're leading a discipleship group or you're leading your children. Our goal is to not lead people to us, not lead people to the flesh, Sometimes people get in their minds that they're great leaders because they've garnered a following and then they've made those people dependent upon them. That's not good leadership, that's poor leadership. Good leadership brings people in so that they're not dependent upon you, but they're dependent upon Christ and his word and they have all that they need in him. Is that how we're leading? As you're thinking about leading others, whatever that looks like, are you saying, how can I help whatever it takes to get people to see? They must be dependent upon Christ and his word. They start asking him questions. Okay, if you're not the Christ, what then? Are you Elijah? And this is a question that honestly makes quite a bit of sense in terms of the prophets. They knew Old Testament history. And if you know Old Testament history, Elijah never died. Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind. And it was promised in Malachi chapter four, that before the day of the Lord and before the coming, that Elijah would show up. Before the Messiah, Elijah would show up. Well, they mean literally, are you the person, Elijah? Well, no, he's John the Baptist. He's not Elijah. So he says no, and he's being truthful about that. But what Jesus will say later is Elijah did come. He wasn't literally Elijah, but he took up the prophetic office or the prophetic mantle of Elijah in the way that he came. He was, that's why he was dressed similarly. It's his office of calling people back to the covenant, calling people to the Messiah. I'm not, I'm not Elijah, he says. And they say, are you the prophet? And so this is a reference to Deuteronomy 18. Moses spoke prophetically by 1,500 years before this moment that a prophet was coming, that the people needed to listen to his voice. And it was a messianic kind of promise. John says, I'm not the prophet. Who's the prophet? Jesus is the one who that passage is about. He answers, no. So in verse 22, they say to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? 
They're upset because John is seeing a great outpouring of the working of the spirit and there is a great movement taking place and the religious establishment has nothing to do with it because they had turned their backs upon the Lord. They had to turn their backs upon the truth. Who had authorized this ministry? The Father in heaven had authorized it. The Lord Jesus had authorized it. And so what does John say? He said, verse 23, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, if you go back to Isaiah 40 and read, you should have it up on the screen. It says, 700 years earlier, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level. The rough place is a plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That's saying God is going to be revealed. Well, who is Jesus? That's who he is. The fullness of deity dwell bodily. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. John saying, listen, I'm the servant. The king is coming. I'm the servant and I'm telling you, the Lord is about to show up and all flesh is going to see it together. So he's saying, we need to make straight the way of the Lord. It's a literal picture of uneven ground saying those need to be flattened. What needs to happen is hearts need to become clear pathways to receive Christ. This morning, is that where your heart is? Is there a flat ground in your heart for easy entrance because you're turning away from your sin and you're ready saying, Jesus, do with me what you will. I wanna serve you. He goes on to say in verse 24, it says, they'd been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing? If you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet, John answered them, I baptize with water. So essentially I'm not changing anyone. This is symbolic. My ministry, it's getting people ready. But among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He's pointing here to the worthiness of Christ as king. To untie sandals was the job of a slave. To untie sandals and to wash the feet of a master. And John is saying, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. That is how holy Jesus is. This is how perfect Jesus is. This is how weighty it is that Jesus is king. I don't deserve anything. And yet he's full of grace and truth. The king has come. He's come to reign. And we need to understand it's not just relevant for them. Even John's preaching is not just relevant to them. It's relevant to us. I want to read you why in Matthew's gospel and a portion of John's preaching, Matthew chapter 3 Verse 10, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. This is the kind of thing he was saying. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Then in verse 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, Jesus, so John the Baptist is telling people, he's about to, that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus has come to save. Jesus is the light of the world. But also he's saying, when he comes, he's going to judge. The ax is laid to the root of the trees. When he returns, he's going to pick up the ax. And those that do not belong to him are going to be cut down. I want you to see this because in John's preaching, there is an intermingling of the advents of Christ, of the coming of Christ. Christ came once and he was ready for them for that first coming then, but he was preaching as those events are together. John's preaching still hasn't fully been fulfilled in Christ's second advent. His second coming has not happened, yet it's going to happen. And he says, the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Are you ready? Do you fear the Lord? Are you ready that he is coming? If you trusted in Christ, is your faith in him? It's why Paul says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. He's coming. We will meet him. I talked to a young guy this week who was hurting and said he just lost a friend. And he asked me, what happens to someone after they die? 
you meet this king is what happens. Of course, we wanna dress people in grace and compassion and gentleness, but are we ready? Are you ready? But the good news is the Lord Jesus made us a way to be ready. Look here in verse 29, second point, if you're taking notes, he comes to die. It says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There may not be many greater statements in scripture than that one. It is a fearful thing because he is returning. He is coming to judge, but good news, he's coming to take away the sin of the world. He's the lamb of God. There is no confusion in John's ministry about why Jesus shows up. It's about the forgiveness of sin. He is the lamb of God. He's the lamb of God. Hear that this morning, who's come to take away your sin. And using that title, he brings us all this Old Testament imagery. I just wanna give you two for a couple perspectives. One is the Passover in Exodus chapter 11 and 12. God warns Israel during their time of enslavement in Egypt that he's sending judgment into Egypt and that every firstborn of every family is going to die unless they're covered by what? The blood of the lamb. They're commanded to sacrifice a lamb, to paint the blood of the lamb on their doorpost. And as it happened and they did it that night when that destroyer angel came through Egypt, the wrath did not fall on those covered by the lamb. Jesus, when he, John the Baptist, when he says Jesus is the lamb of God, is saying he is the one that helps us escape the wrath of the father. The blood just doesn't cover us. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sin. Through faith in Christ, the wrath fell upon him. It doesn't have to fall upon us. And so one, the lamb of God brings us to an understanding of wrath-bearing, judgment-bearing sacrifice. But also, if you look back to Genesis 22, there's another picture of a lamb with a little bit different of an angle. Genesis 22, now we're talking over 2,000 years before this moment that's taken place, we're reading. Abraham was commanded by God, take your son, your only son, the son who you love, and take him up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him there and offer him as a burnt offering. Now just think about that language for a second and the language of John about Jesus, the only son of the father, the love of the father, for the son. Abraham was commanded there to take Isaac up. And as he did, they were going up the mountain and Isaac realized something was missing. He says, father, we have the wood, we have everything ready, but where is the lamb? Where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham famously said, God will provide for himself the lamb, my son. And they get up to that altar and he straps Isaac down and he raises up the knife to obey the command of the Lord. But of course, the Lord does not require his son of him. He stops him. And there Abraham looks over and what is provided? A substitute, a ram in the thicket. And he takes that ram and pulls Isaac off the altar. Isaac doesn't have to die. Why? Because the ram died in his place. There's an angle here of substitution. But notice, Abraham said, God will provide the lamb, but it wasn't a lamb, it was a ram. That's not an accident. It wasn't time for the lamb yet. John said it's time for the lamb, the real lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He has taken the wrath of God for sinners. He has died as a substitute. We deserve to die. He has died in our place. And he's been raised in order that we might have life. Do you believe? Do you trust? This is the only way for your sin to be removed. When we're sharing with people in Louisville, I hope we're not just saying, hey, you need God in your life. You just need to experience mercy or other little quaint sayings. We have to tell people, you need Jesus. Listen, I need Jesus. I have sinned, be humble about it. It's not like we're just telling people something that's not, untrue, that's not true of us. I've sinned and you've sinned and Jesus is coming and yet Jesus has died for sin at the cross in our place, taking judgment, repent and believe the gospel. Turn away from your sin, trust in Christ for salvation. 
I hope that's the message we're giving because it's the only one. We have to know it, we have to trust it, we have to give it. John proclaims, make straight the way of the Lord. The king is coming. We are not worthy of him, yet he comes in grace and truth. He comes as the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And final point, point three, is he comes to save because of this. In verse 30, it says, this is it, he of whom I said after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Think about this. John the Baptist was born first, but he didn't exist first. Jesus always has existed. This is the son of God. He ranks before me because he is the Lord himself. After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. That's why he, his whole mission was taking place. Ultimately, it was a revealing of the Christ. And John bore witness, verse 32, I saw, he's talking about the baptism of Christ now. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. This is so important. This is the moment of the affirmation of Jesus's identity in the beginning of his public ministry. That moment when John baptized him and the father said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And he sent the spirit as an affirmation of the identity of Christ. Because what did the spirit do in that moment? It showed the anointing of the Lord was on him. That's what Messiah means. That's what Christ means. It means the anointed one. Jesus is the one anointed of the spirit. And John says the spirit didn't just descend, it remained on him. Never had this happened for anyone. The spirit of God in the Old Testament always would come on people for a time for a certain task, but no, with Jesus, the spirit of the Lord remained upon him. Perfect union with the spirit. This was significant as a fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance. The year of the Lord's favor is the coming of Christ in that first advent and the year of his vengeance is coming when he returns again. John says, verse 33, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water says to me, he whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and bore witness that this is the son of God. This announcement of John is so critical in all of this. He comes as king, he comes to die, and because of his death and his resurrection, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? This is new covenant language. This is something that had never been experienced by anyone at this point in history. What Jesus has done has made it possible for us to be changed inwardly. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is what happens when a person believes in Christ, their heart is changed, their heart is made alive. They go from being dead in sin to alive in Christ. We're talking about regeneration. And the Spirit of God, you're baptized in the Spirit of God upon faith in Christ, meaning that you're filled with the Spirit who changes your desires, who changes your affections, who changes your entire life to the degree, the Bible says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. It's not like you've turned over a new leaf. You were dead. And he has made you alive. When does baptism in the Holy Spirit happen? It happens once upon salvation. Ephesians chapter one, verse 13 says, when we believe the gospel, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who's the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Who does that? The son of God. So the question today for everyone, are you ready? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit, truly changed by Jesus through faith in his cross? Stop waiting. Stop dragging. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Turn from your unbelief and surrender to Jesus who is full of grace and truth, who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He loves you and longs to change. 
I wanna have an opportunity for response today. The passage is so clear about salvation. We're about to have a song of response and we're gonna bring up some counselors up front. Listen, if you know, if you know that you need to respond to the gospel today, man, you can do that in your seat. You can put your faith in Christ in your seat, but you need to tell somebody because you need to be baptized as a symbol of what's taking place to you. Come let someone know, come talk to someone. If you have questions, talk to one of our counselors. But also I wanna invite you to hear this in the ministry of John as an encouragement to say, church, we have to lead people to Christ. There's no laziness in the kingdom of God. People are dying in their sin and we have the message of the gospel by which men and women are saved. Would we pray? Would you pray for those who are lost? Would you pray for courage and boldness for our church? Let's cry out to the Lord that he would ready us for his return. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for your word and the urgency that you place according to your word, according to your spirit. Lord, may we respond urgently and most importantly to you. Jesus, thank you for who you are, that you are the lamb who has died, that was slain, who is worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. Jesus, we worship you and thank you. May we respond how we ought. And I pray in your name, amen.